Hey, everybody. I've got Matt and Janet here. Matt, could you give me some good advice on how to build trust with a third-party vendor? Sure, David. Uh, understand what they care about and answer their questions before they ask you. Ooh, that's a good tip. Janet, give me some bad advice on working with a third-party vendor. I think that would be not being upfront with them and transparent with them, kind of jerking yeah. them around a little. Yeah, we've all had yeah. that before. Matt, can you give me worse advice? Uh, yeah, if they tell you they're concerned about something, tell them you don't think it's that big of a deal. Ooh, that's a good one. I like that. Well, let's begin. Get ready. It's Super Cyber Friday. Hey, everybody. It is Super Cyber Friday. To welcome today's topic is hacking trust management and our critical thinking on how to prove you're the company others want to work with. So we're going to actually talk about it in both directions, like working with companies and also presenting yourself as a good, trustworthy company as well. Uh, our guests, you just met them. That's Janet Hines. She's the CISO of Chen. And she's also the CISO over at iHeartMedia. So this is a new gig for her. And I'm assuming she's trying to build trust with a lot of people or having people trust her, too, for that matter. And also we have Matt Cooper, who, if you were here last week, you got to trust him back then. So hopefully you trust him now. He's a senior manager of privacy, risk, and compliance over at Vanta. All right, Vanta, they're our awesome sponsor for today's episode. Thank you, Vanta, for supporting our shows. Uh, greatly appreciate it. All right, lots of different ways to participate. You know most of them, but let me just point out the ways uh, we're going to do the bad idea and the good ideas, how not to build trust with another organization, how not to do it. I'm sure you're going to have some good ideas. The more creative, the better. And we want you to challenge our guests because we will play the department of yes later. And also uh, for 10% better tips, let's see if you can outdo your bad tips with good tips. Just label them 10%. By the way, if anyone wants to come on, just say, bring me on and we'll try to get you on the show to ask a question or make a comment. All right, do ask questions, by the way. If you look in the uh, on the right, there's a little question mark bubble. Click on that and put your questions in there. Uh, so today's schedule, you saw the good advice, bad advice. We'll play the, um, you'll do the bad ideas, the 10%. We'll play the public interest, play the department of yes. And at the very end of the show, we will have our meetup. Please come to our meetup. If you are brand new and you have never, ever attended it, it's a lot of fun. We will direct you to it. It'll actually be the button, button at the bottom of the screen. But... Currently, the button at the bottom of the screen promotes next week's Super Cyber Friday. This is our third to last show. So we'll have two more before the end of the year. And our uh, so our penultimate show will be next week. That'll be Hacking Cyber Resilience. You can click the link uh, right down there below. And, uh, and it will not take you out of this chat. I always stress that. You can go and register and still be in this chat. So we highly recommend you do that. And I will remind you multiple times during the show, but why not do it right this second? All right, let's get to our very, very first topic. This is a hot, 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 hot topic. This comes up again and again and again, is trying to trust third-party vendors. And I can't stress how frustrating it seems everyone finds it. Where do you think the, the biggest frustration is, Matt? Um, well, I think there could be a lot of different frustrations. Um, you know, I think when you feel you've done a good job assessing a vendor and then something bad happens, I think that's a potential uh, source of frustration. It, it reflects badly on you because you're does. the one that said, oh, they're great to work with. And then exactly. something awful happens. And I think uh, for practitioners, just the process can be frustrating. Uh, you like the, the time it takes and the, uh, the friction that it adds to the sales process uh, can be frustrating as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, Jana, what have you, you've dealt with this, I'm sure plenty of times. And by the way, has that ever bitten in your ass? You know, the, the whole thing of, Oh, you know, I, I trust this vendor and then something horrible happens and it like comes back and it's a stain on you. Yeah. I mean, I had, I don't know that I've actually taken the, the, you know, the fall for it, so to speak, but certainly but it, it makes just doesn't look good for you. It makes you, and also makes you question yourself, right? Question your processes. Are we really doing due diligence or are we just checking boxes? You know, that kind of thing. It's so, and the world is of, you know, this vendor and then there's subcontractors and it just, it's comp more complicated, right? So third party, fourth party, whatever you want to, you know, call them, they keep going. And so you have to, uh, I don't think we know what we don't what we don't know, right? And so mm -hmm. it's hard to get to the bottom of everything when you're doing these assessments or even just building a relationship and understanding how the vendor works and how they work with you. 
I'm going to ID just a few of these bad ideas. James Sparenberg, who, by the way, won Best Bad Idea from our last show. Good job for James. Um, he suggests opening up all tickets as urgent PII, which uh, or P1, I'm sorry, property oh. one, P1, not PII, uh, P1. Um, that means they're going to get done, right? If you mark everyone as urgent. Matt, what do you think? Well, uh, no, because you only have so many people to open tickets. So you're just going to have more uh, high priority tickets not being fulfilled, I think, if you do that. Right. But again, if we were playing the Department of Yes, you would say yes, because that would be the the, the right way. But we're not playing Department of Yes right yet. Okay. So, by the way, get your questions in right now. So, let me ask you, Janet. What is, maybe something you've done new within the past year or two, what is one proactive step that you have done that is new to help build trust? That you're like, oh, I'm glad I'm doing this because this is working out better. What do you think that is? I think it's really focusing on the partnership and the relationship of the vendor, right? And and understanding what's going on in, in, in their space as well as having ex- the expectation that they understand what's going on in our space. So really keeping that a, a nice two-way um, relationship. Can you can you dig a level deeper? Like how did how does like how does it begin and how does that evolve? And again, you you don't have to go tell the long story, but like give me the crib notes of that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm certainly asking uh, when you have quarterly business reviews or whatever your regular cadence is with your vendors, um, making sure that they're bringing to you what their roadmap looks like, right? Mm-hmm. Because their roadmap that might not just be a technology roadmap. It may be an acquisition roadmap. It may be a organizational change roadmap. Like there's a lot of things that go on in roadmaps. And by really understanding what your future state, what your vendor's partner's future state looks like, you can adjust how you, you know, how you work with them. Um, you can have empathy for the fact that they've, they, their company is going through stuff too. Like we all work mm-hmm. for companies that go through stuff and, mm-hmm. you know, just it kind of levels the playing field and makes it a little bit more of a, uh, I don't know, I'm say personal relationship, but a little more closely, close, a little closer relationship. Just in general, we hear that from a lot of CISOs saying we want a partner. Uh, Matt, I'm going to assume you hear this from your customers as well all the time. All the time, yeah. So let me uh, so I, let me ask the same question I was asking Jenna, and this could be something new that you're doing or your customers are doing. What is what has been the sort of the the biggest shift in improving the trust relationship? This is for me, uh, David. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Matt. the the um, you know, like I like I kind of alluded to in my my first opening statement here about answering questions before they're mm-hmm. asked. Um, you know, we've been trying to be upfront and basically put out uh, behind you know appropriate guardrails the information that we know they already want to see. So this could look like pre-filling questionnaires, making our compliance certificates readily available, um, and you know, demonstrating for for our customers that we understand how important this is. And we're emphasizing that, uh, making it easy for them to find the information and showing that we already care about these things before they come and ask us. This is a really interesting theme. And I want to double down on this. And and Janet is nodding her head is, and I've seen this with, you know, you know, in, in just work is when someone brings to you something you didn't think about, didn't see, wasn't on your radar that is a huge trust builder. Yes, Janet? Yes. Yeah, for sure. And and just to kind of go back to what Matt was talking about, I think that, um, you know, it's not a surprise anymore that we're going to ask for this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so to, to be, have it at the ready is always a great sign, right? It's a, it's a sign that the vendor understands your perspective and knows where you're coming from and isn't like, oh, I got to go dig that up from so, somewhere. Like, really? <laughs> we're all asking for this all the time now. Right. And and that gets into just having your processes in place. I mean, some people have better processes and access to data than others, Matt. I mean, this is, uh, you know, it, it's great when someone says that literally can answer on the fly these questions and those that say, it takes me a week to tell you. And I will just say, the larger the company, the slower the movement. I've noticed. Yes, Matt? Yeah, totally. I mean, and Janet made the point too. Um, if you know what they want to ask you and you're prepared to answer, it looks like you care about this more and you've thought about this more. If they're asking you seemingly basic questions that, you know, everyone should be asking you and you don't really know the answer, or you have to go and find it out. Uh, you look less prepared, 
or like you don't prioritize this information in your organization. All right. Well, actually, before we jump into our first game, let me. This is actually, I think, a good setup for you, Matt, to talk about specifically what Vanta is doing with their tool. Because you, you know, essentially, I mean, w- what is the tool to help us be more efficient in this process? Let's walk through it, and then we'll get we'll jump into our first game. Sure. Okay. I'm going to talk about it on two different levels. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm pretty excited about this. So on the first level. It's almost like helping a company to market this information, make it part of your your story. Um, mm-hmm. That is your security posture, and so, like literally having a public facing or a customer facing website where you walk through a lot of the things that you do around security and compliance or privacy, and then again making um, questionnaires, pre filled questionnaires using maybe an industry standard format available, mm-hmm. having the certifications available so that you are showing to customers that, okay, I take this seriously. So Vanta actually has a a, a software package which enables our customers to do this very thing. So not only do we help them to, let's say, obtain a compliance certification like an ISO or an attestation like a SOC 2, but then to, uh, you know, put that forward to their customers. So that's one level. So and just this, and just reasserting yeah, what we were just saying, but but moments ago, it's a more of a push rather than a pull. I, it's not me exactly. constantly asking for it. It's in your face. It's presented to you, like what we were saying. It's better when it's given to us before we even ask for it. And that's exactly, exactly what you're doing. Precisely, and this you know for for SaaS companies, which is a lot of our customers, you know this is pretty essential. You know, you go to their web page, you scroll to the very bottom in the fine print. They have terms of service, and they also have trust and security and you can go there and and see all this you know a lot of information right up front so that's the first level the second level is something that's more of an innovation um and something i've we've sometimes heard referred to as trust architecture so if you think about um the idea that um this problem we talked about initially which is you do an initial review of a vendor but the, the vendor is constantly changing. Their product is constantly changing. Their organization is constantly changing. So how do you monitor them on an ongoing basis going forward, right? And if you think of a federal compliance standard, like a FedRAMP, you know, continuous monitoring, CONMON, it's like a big part of it. You have to continuously now monitor what folks are doing. And there hasn't been a really great tool set for doing that. Now, there are some services that have been essentially like scanning public facing IP addresses and the infrastructure behind them. But there's a lot of people that feel that those are low quality results because of, you know, you're scanning a a marketing website that's not actually attached to anything. And then you're inferring something about a security posture that's actually going to affect your customer's data. You know, there's a lot of challenges with that. And so what Vanta is doing is we have built uh, an interconnected system that was originally, I think, thought of to help build internal assurance and help an organization manage and prepare uh, for like a compliance audit. And then we said, oh, hey, you, we could actually use that same infrastructure to provide you know, carefully tailored and filtered information in real time about our security posture to the partners that we open it up to. And so building uh, a monitoring infrastructure that actually allows you to see a little bit into the company's security posture on key things that they care about. I'm pretty excited about that. Excellent. Very excellent. Well, we will bring this up again uh, before the end of the show, but we now have our next game. Do you know what others are thinking? On the public interest. All right, Janet, you have not played this game before. Matt. I have not. Last time. Matt, do you remember how well you did? Again, we have four questions. You I, did, how many uh, you I did so, so, so. I, I didn't do terrible, but I didn't get them all. All right. I did not, I have not looked at these, so I'm going to play along as well. And I can't stress this enough. It's, it's four questions. You will see what they are in just a second. It's very tif- difficult to get four out of four. I think, I know we've had one. I didn't question whether we've had two winners who've done four out of four. I know ever, we've had audience members that have had as well, but I always stress, I'll be impressed if you can pull off four out of four. All right. Let's go. First question is, whoops. First question is monthly average month, uh, most average monthly search queries for these. Is it SIM or is it SOAR? And I, and I can't stress this enough. Whenever you look at these, don't immediately assume that these are only um, 
people in cybersecurity searching these. Okay, it's all search queries. So uh, which one do you think it is, SIM or SOAR? Which gets more? I'm going to throw it to both Matt, Jen. I'm, I'll answer now. I think it's SIM. That's what I I'm going to SIM too. It's older. I think, it, I think it's SOAR. You think it's SOAR? All right. We got we have a mixture here, SIM or SOAR. Let's see where we go. It is SOAR oh, already. Janet. Janet's kicking her butt already. All right. All right. Oh my, geez, oh, two to one practically there. It's got to be, a, you know, other people searching the word SOAR for something else. All right. Next one. Authorization, automation, or authentication. Ooh, that is a lot of one. Um, uh, all right. I don't want to answer first. I'll let you I'll go. go automa first. Automation. I'll go You're D. going automation? Yeah. I agree. Saying? Automation. I'm going D too. I'm going automation as well. I think there's a lot of Ds here. Uh, there's a few of others, but let's see what we got. Ah, yes, automation. All right. All right. Matt and I each have one. Janet has two for two. She's kicking butt here. All right. Next one. Lease privilege or RBAC? Uh, I, I don't want to say first. I'm going to let you go, Janet, first. What do you say? I'm going to say lease privilege. I, I want to say lease privilege, too. I'm going to go, I'm going to go R back. All right. Our back for Matt, Jen, and I stay with least privilege, and the correct answer is oh, ooh, Janet nice gets one. Pissed. All right, now Matt and Janet are tied. Could this be the tiebreaker? We're going to find out. Uh, I am uh, sadly just have one correct one: a certificate authority or public key infrastructure. Which one do you think it is? Which one, you say, which one are you choosing? For me, Certificate Authority. Certificate Authority? What do you think? <clears throat> I'll go PKI. I'm going PKI, although I think more people type PKI than public key infrastructure. That's my problem. If, if PKI was an option, I would have picked that. Definitely would be the winner. Let's do it. But I'm going public key infrastructure. Oh, oh, no. All right, Janet. Three for four. Very, very good showing. Extremely good showing. Did we get oh. anybody that went four for four here? Anybody? Please let me know if you went four for four. All right, let's get back to the, to our show at hand. And we do have a few questions that did come in. So please, again, uh, pipe up if you have a question. Why? There it is. This one comes from Jeff Wright, who asks, has anyone considered creating a trust register? Now, I haven't actually heard of a trust register, but I can kind of guess what the heck it is. Trust is built brick by brick and destroyed with one big screw up. Um, actually, I'm going to add to that. Have you had a vendor had a big screw up and you still kept them on and why? You don't have to name the name, but be interested. So I'm interested, have you done something like this, like a trust register? But I'm thinking like everything you were talking about, Matt, is kind of sounds like a trust register. Yes, Matt? Uh, in a way, uh, I, I assume the questioner means something slightly different, uh, maybe like a ranking of how trustworthy organizations are or... You yeah, know, Jeff, like a, pipe a up if you shame. meant something different. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Um, and then to answer your question, uh, David. Uh, yeah, different from a I, risk register. I, I got that, Jeff. Yeah. I, I, we have not, I've not experienced this professionally where we had a, a vendor have a big issue and we, we stayed with them. But personally, definitely. Uh, you know, I there's personal service providers that have had breaches. And I still use their products or services. I have, I have as well. Just good. Uh, often the cost of exit is too painful. Or they're Janet, huge. And yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's where I was going to go. Certainly, the cost to leave is painful, time consuming. You know, could be a big change management issue for your company. Um, there's lots of reasons. Uh, and then getting, you know, what you the, the challenge I find is getting the assuredness you need after an incident because um, they put out, you know understandably why very you know legal ease you know legally reviewed and approved messages that don't really say a lot so let it's hard to get, get into that between the Actually, lines i want to get into that discussion of exiting when when a relationship goes sour because you know i i just before we went live i was telling the two of the uh, i was telling both matt and janet about an experience i had using a horrible horrible product microsoft had called business contact manager which was labeled as a CRM. And I said it should have been arrested for false advertising because it was far, far from being that. Anyways, the, the story that I quickly told was they had all this, I had all this data that I had entered into it. 
And while I could get the, the basic contact information out, I could not get the notes field out. There was literally zero way to export the notes field. And I ended up hiring someone to copy and paste it out into uh, a Google contact managers, you know, the Google contact thing, which cost me a few hundred dollars to get that done, but wasn't the end of the world. But I, after that experience, I said, I am never, ever going to buy another piece of technology if I don't know how to get out of it. So Janet, have you had this experience? Like in your negotiation, you want to know how you can leave a tech. Have you had these negotiations? Uh, I'd say it's difficult to get into that conversation because typically you're working, if you're working with the bigger companies, you're working with on their paper, right? On their, yeah. their terms and redlining, things like that is typically really, really hard because they want to recognize the revenue and be able to, you know, continue to recognize that revenue. Um, I have had, um, the opportunity with, uh, one vendor to mutually, uh, term mm -hmm. and, um, that was, although it was an unpleasant experience, the reason how we had to term it was, you know, handled very, very well. Um, well, then, but, then that's, but it's rare. It's very rare. Well, like I was telling you, a friend of mine was having a, a pretty nasty experience, unfortunately, with Microsoft that wanted to raise their rates 40%. And the thing is, when you have people, you know, they know things that are, you know, you're locked in, you're, you're in, you know, you're industry wide. This is more of an IT decision than it was a security decision. And he had better replacements for security than he did IT uh, or, you know, IT did. And so, you know, they, you know, the vendors know this, that they can have you over a barrel pulling stuff like this. So Matt, I mean, what, what have you seen maybe with your, with your customers in this? Because Sometimes relationships go sour or sometime a vendor takes advantage of you and wants to raise your rates 40%. Yeah. And that, oh, that's hard. If you're on a, you know, everyone's on a Microsoft operating system, where do you go from there? Uh, mm -hmm. The one thing I would say is that if you look at like gold standard, how to do third party assessment, specifically around SaaS products and cloud hosting products, this is actually a formal criteria that you should be assessing when you onboard with them, which they call vendor lock-in, because it's clear that if you build your entire enterprise on some specific third-party cloud host, for example, it's excruciating to have to go and then change that down the road. And, and you almost won't be able to do it unless you have planned for it from the beginning um, and you're continuously accounting for that, but that's a lot of overhead. And, you know, I think most organizations probably in reality don't have the bandwidth to do that. You know, you, you try to make a good decision up front, but once you've made that decision, you are pretty much committed and locked in, uh, to certain vendors because of the unique service that they provide or because of the amount of, um, you know, dependency that you have on them. So just as for everyone's amusement to watch later. Uh, I'm popping a YouTube video. Years ago, I did a video where I interviewed. This is so the irony of it. I, it was for Juniper Networks, and I was at the VMware. No, no, no. I was at a Cisco event. Uh, I'm sorry. This was a Cis and I asked people, "What do you love about vendor lock-in?" And it was. It's a pretty funny video. So give it a watch when you get a chance. Um, so uh, let's move on. Oh, we got a ton of questions that just came in. And uh, by the way, let me remind everyone, get your bad ideas in. I see a ton of coming in right now. Uh, please vote. You can vote up the questions as well. Like when a lot come in, I want to know. Uh... Oh, this is a good question from Sum Chai Yao, who asked for you, Janet. You said challenge is the assurance you need, uh, need after an inc incident. And so Sum Chai asks, what kind of assurance evidence would be enough? That's a great question. Um, I do think that um, being able to, you know, it, it's a sensitive time, right? So if a vendor, anybody goes through a security incident, they don't know everything yet. It may, may take months to really understand everything, but just that transparency, even just saying we don't know everything yet, right? But here's what we do know. Um, I know a lot of the notices will say like some customers, first name, last name, email address, whatever, you know, they, they give you this like vague uh, and maybe more, maybe other things. So they're trying to give you something without giving anything. Um, I think having the uh, vendor rep be the person that's contacting you, which is also helpful, and um, being willing to take your questions back 
and get you answers. And I've, I've had that. I've had it where we've had partners that have had, you know, across my experience in my career, I've had partners that have had incidents. And when they can be more transparent and not just give you that canned answer and really seek to help you find the answers you need. And so specifically, I think it's important to know, you know, is it contained, right? Is it contained? Is it, um, is the, the vector, you know, mitigated, right? Like, mm -hmm. do we know how, do you, if you know, if you know how you're is that mitigated? So there's just like some basic things. I don't have to tell you how, which vector, you know, how they were exploited or just, just some answers that bring, raise my confidence level. So those are, the, those are the kind of questions I like to get answers to. Dwayne Grant actually makes an interesting comment. And, and this actually, I don't think this is strange at all, Dwayne. He says, as strange as it can sound, I have actually seen a client relationship improve after a security privacy incident because they respected how we handled it and acted uh, as a partner in the resolution. I see that like people during a firefight, like you see how well they perform. You're like, oh, I'm glad we're with them. Yeah, I'm, you must have had that experience. Yes, Janet? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it, and, yeah. You're like, and it, but it, but it comes from actually knowing how they reacted, right? Yeah. Like really knowing what they did and how they uh, interacted with us, as opposed to just letting the canned letter go out and not being able to give let the the actual reps that I have a relationship with tell me anything. And I, again, I'm not looking for the stuff that they can't tell me because as as someone who's been through security incidents for companies, I know there's things you just can't talk about, right? But there's other right. ways yeah. of kind of settling it down a little. So, so Matt, that's actually an interesting comment is that like relationships actually improve and everyone's kind of agreeing here is that relationships can improve during the hardest times. I don't know if, if, if this is part of the Vanta tool, but where do you sort of support that? I guess is my question. Well, I, I, I would totally agree. Um, and I think Janet really hit the nail on the head, which is about transparency. You know, we did have a, a a situation where we got something similar from a vendor and it was a very, you know, legalistic high level. Hey, we had a, an issue. We're looking into it. And I, I'm pretty sympathetic to that. As Janet said too, like, you know, that's what you would do as an organization. That's kind of what you have to do. And then it's, the, but it's that next step when you reach out to the team directly or your, your reps, um, you know, do they make time for you and do they provide, you know, some level of transparency there. Uh, can they answer your questions, even if they won't give you details? You know, do, you can just get like a read, a vibe, if you will, on how seriously are they taking this? You know, do they seem like they know what they are doing? Are they able to, you know, at least, you know, empathize with our questions? Uh, that's one aspect. And then another aspect where, you know, to this uh, chat point about, you know, an incident actually improving trust is when companies are being transparent on things that are even like lower level, right? So like a, a thing that wasn't actually a major incident that impacted me, but it was maybe a software bug that they experienced and there was some low level impact and they felt compelled to come and tell their customers about it in the interest of transparency. And you're like, wow, you know, that's, I'm impressed that, you know, th they're willing to do that for their customers uh, because that's the, like the ethical standard or, you know, whatever corporate standard they have uh, that they want to be very above board, you know, with the things that are happening. That's a really good comment about above board. Let me tell a quick story here. And I'm interested to know if either of you had, had anything similar. So for those of you who've been part of the Super Cyber Friday or when we used to call it just a CISO series video chat, uh, we used to use a different technology at the end of the show where we did this sort of random matchup. And that company who, who did that technology, we use something different now called Toucan, which by the way, again, reminding everyone, please join us for that at the end of the show. And also while you're waiting, click the button below and register for next week's. That's a sidebar. But back to my story. I spoke to them. They had drastically changed their pricing model, where it's like a per head that would appear. And it, it, it jumped dramatically. It was like multiple fold more expensive. And so I sort of complained about it. And the, the salesperson said, what if I gave you an 80% discount? And it was like, wait a second, you've been gouging me that much that you're gonna that you can still make money if you give me an 80% discount. I I was like, screw, I don't want to work with you if you're if that's our relationship. And and then the other, the I mean, the other thing was we were complaining about one thing with the algorithm, and their response was, Oh, well, nobody else is complaining about it. Like, well, it's something obviously broken. They are, they, nobody else can see it, you know. <laughs> So those were two really glaring things. Have you had a situation where just their business practices were so off mark that you're like, well, we can't do business together if that's the way you operate, Janet? 
Well, I mean, in the examples that you give, I think that uh, the the pricing game to me that's that's the transparency, right? Like if you're coming mm -hmm. to me and telling me that it's my, my retail price is this per he, per seat, and then oh, but I can give you a sixty percent. You know, when they start coming in with these really big discounts, it's like that. Then why are you even talking? You know, I lose faith, I lose trust, right? Because yeah, then you don't I, know what else what else is like got a got a bottom that you didn't get to yet. You know, and it makes you question. Um, but I've but had I, the flip side where the price is too low, and I'm like, wait a second, there's something wrong here. Yeah, yeah it's trying little, to get yeah. trying to get your trying to get your your logo on their website. Trying to get, yeah, that yeah, yeah. happens too. Um, but you know, you should definitely if it's too good to be true. You know, you should think yeah, it's probably yeah. too good to be true. <laughs> and I, someone in the comments, I'm, I'm not sure where I saw it uh, earlier, was talking about you know actually uh, using your network to um, to hear about these vendors, right? So if you so if you've got a vendor and it's too low, it seems too low. Find out if anyone in your network is using them and how are they and you know, the whole, you know, I don't know if you want to compare apples to apples all the time, but, you know, this is what we're looking to buy from them. And is that what you had? And how does, how does this look to you? I mean, I think that, and of course, how do they perform? I think is important as well when you're using your network. So I really like that idea. I'm going to can't credit the person who said it because it scrolled off, but I appreciate that comment. You can always scroll back up. Uh, all right. So Matt, Matt I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, and then we're going to go to our next game uh, shortly what experiences of sort of just business practices and it could be something that you personally had or you saw through one of your vendors or one of your customers working with their vendors um where just sort of odd business practices just set up red flags sure um well i the 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 thing that jumps out to me actually was less about a business practice and it was more around the technical detail of what this vendor was doing so when we do an assessment of a vendor that presents a material risk for us inherently. Um, we, we really actually kind of put them through the ringer. You know, we do a security and compliance review, but then we have an actual security engineering team asking for a pen test, reading the questionnaire responses and, and actually coming back to them and asking them questions. And I, I can definitely recall a specific vendor who is going to be, you know, a, a critical technical service for us. And when we dug under the covers and really into like the technical aspect of their business, we were not comfortable with how their product operated and we were not able to move forward, you know, with that relationship. So um, I can't think of like a business practice, you know, per se, but that is the one thing that that jumps out to me is the the technology piece. And I, but I think it could go, um, you know, either way, it would just depend on your circumstance. All right. I'm going to throw out another question here. And by the way, I'm just looking at some of these bad ideas. I'm trying to pick the one that I'm going to tag both of you with in our department of yes. But uh, Matthew Bybee uh, asked this question. And this is a really good one, by the way. And I'd, I'd be interested to know, have you ever worked with a vendor that's done this really well? And if so, please tell the example of it. Matthew asks, how do you maintain a good relationship with customers when there is constant turnover within the vendor community and the customer? And we've had all this experience before. We have a great relationship with an individual. They leave and you're like, your relationship with that vendor is just, or customer either way, has just turned really, it's like, it becomes non-existent. I've had, that's usually what happens to me. Uh, either one of you just sort of jump in. What? Can you say one vendor that's handled this really well when there's turnover, they, they say, this is your new person. They're working with you. Let's set up a meeting. Like who, who's done this well, Janet? Yeah. I can call out the vendor by name, Sentinel one. Yeah. Yeah. How, really how well. did they handle this? Um, the way I think you would expect it to be right. That they're the person that you're working with for so many, so long doesn't just disappear, right? Like they're actually, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a transition period and, and you get to know the new, uh, the new rep or the new count team. It's not usually just one person, right? It's usually an account team, depending on the reason, like if they're, they restructure their territories or whatever, mm -hmm. right. Um, versus the person just left the company or got promoted. So I think that's really important. I think having, uh, you know, a nice handshake, a nice smooth transition, um, is, is, that's that's the way it's been most effective for me. Mm -hmm. What about you, Matt? I mean, I think that's that's good. I think the um, the continuity of the human relationship is important. Are they, do they come to you and let you know, uh, you know, what's happening? Do they make an effort uh, to do an actual transition with you versus just you send an email and it bounces back and you have to go find who your new you know point of contact is? Um, and I think secondarily. 
you know, can they continue to just offer the service that they were offering to you before with the new team that's in place? You know, when you send the email to your old rep, does it bounce back or does it get, you know, auto forwarded to the new person and they jump in, they're like, Hey, Oh, sorry, we haven't met yet, but, uh, you know, I'm your, I'm your new person and we're going to take care of this for you. So I think it's a combination, you know, it's kind of that, that basic business, um, respect and concern on the human level. Um, but also on the service level. Excellent point. All right, let's get to our uh, next game here. We just we got a call that just came in. Hello, welcome to the Department of Yes, where no request is ever rejected. All right, so I'm going to play. I'm going to have Matt answer first because this he's played this before. He's very familiar with this. I'm going to say that uh, this first one's pretty tough. I'm going to I'm going to get ready, brace yourself. I'm going to see how you answer this one. It comes from Jeff Wright. And um, whenever – here's his suggestion, and I want to know why you want to do this. Whenever something bad happens, so it could be literally anything, find someone to blame and call them out publicly. Why do you want to do this? Uh, well, you don't, want, you don't want them to think it's your fault. And if it really was their fault, uh, they, they should take the fall for it. So that's a perfectly reasonable approach. You know, it's it's better to – just deflect and to, you know, kind of, you know, say, Hey, look over there. Uh, this person's actually at fault. It's really not us. We're doing the right thing. All right. I'm going to give you yes! both. It's a little too much facetious there because yes, it is a good idea to just point it out because it wasn't your fault, but the person does work for you. Janet, why is this a good idea? Why do you want to do this? So in this situation, the person works for me. Is that what you just said? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, or no. yeah somebody, something about find someone to blame. You just got to find someone to blame. Actually, I didn't oh, say you didn't say they work. Can you hear me? It's, yeah, I can hear you. Your, your video froze a little bit. No, oh, you're back. Oh, you disappeared. Janet, refresh your browser. Hold on. What happened? Hopefully she'll come back in just a second. Have you ever blamed somebody publicly, Matt? Uh, in real life, uh, that's a bad, my back. bad practice. You're back, but we don't see you. What happened? Ah, here we go. All right. J Janet was trying to duck out of this one. That's what she did. She's blaming it on te tech failure, but she was trying to duck out. Can you hear us, Janet? Janet can't even hear us. Ah, Janet, you can't hear us. Janet. Now, has she frozen? No, she's still there. Janet can't hear us. Oh, Janet. Here, I'm going to just... Janet, you can't, we can see you. Janet, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Refresh your browser again. Refresh browser again. Hold on, we're, we're chatting with her in the back channel, hopefully getting her back. By the way, I saw a presentation yesterday, Matt, a very cool technology, translation technology. And I've never had this happen before. Really cool technology, worst presentation I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> It was a kind of interesting combination. It was a disaster of a presentation for really cool tech. Um, it is crowdsourced. Oh, yes. This is a perfect example. We could just blame it on Crowdcast. Thank you very much, Jesse Metters. Yes. Let's blame it on Crowdcast. Um, uh, hey, let's. Uh, so. Um, hey, Melissa, let's let's not try not to promote things here. What do you say? Um, if you want to mention things, uh, let's, let's do that, uh, during our Your chat. call has been forwarded. What call has been forwarded. So, um, Janet, can you see us, hear us? She can't see or hear us. Um, we don't know Janet's phone. Hopefully, ah, hopefully Janet's refreshing her browser and we'll have her back in a second. My apologies, everybody. I say this because I'm having a disaster of a presentation like the one I saw last night. All right, but I will get you here. You know, while we're waiting for Jan to come back, we're going to pause the game and get you to the next question. This one's from Joshua Mason. Do people go to sites like Security Scorecard before talking to a vendor? Do you find that happening with your customers? Janet, um, can you hear us? Hold it. Wait, Janet, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right, I'm going to pause you on that story. Hold it. I'm going to I'm going to put this one down. Done answer. I'm going to come back to it. I can go to the answer and come, bring it back. All right, Janet, we feel that you let the technology fail on you so you could avoid answering the question. Is that true? That is not true. <laughs> <laughs> but it was awesome timing, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. It was pretty awesome timing. All right. All right. My apologies to everybody with the failure of the technology. By the way, we as as uh, was it Je Jesse Metters pointed out, we can blame this on Crowdcast. 
So, so will you accept that blame, Matt? That we, we blame it on or somebody my, else? Or my internet provider or okay. whatever. Yeah. Or your internet provider. All right. When something <laughs> bad happens, find someone, so not necessarily your employee, find someone to blame and call them out publicly. Why do you want to do this? Janet. Well, because you can show that there are repercussions for bad actions, right? And that by by making sure that people get called out, that they understand that others they, will they recognize maybe, maybe, maybe. not to screw up. Ah, right, right. Because look, this is what happens. Janet got that one. All right. Next one. Uh, the here, I'm debating which ones. Here was. Um, all right, I'm going to go with, uh, well, right, let's go with this one. This one comes from, I'm going to guess this is Matthew Bybee. Um, you know, does it have one T? Matthew spells his name with one T and I can't see. Uh, it's things, co- it's darn things covering up. Yes. No, it's two T. So it's not, maybe not Matthew Bybee. Although th- then again, it's possible Rich typed the name in wrong. But let's see. Matthew, tell me if this one's yours. Or I'm going to make you answer first on this one, Janet. Reassign okay. all P1 support tickets to P4 so that you always meet your SLA and your customers <laughs> will always be happy. Why are you going to do that? Well, definitely we'll always meet our SLAs um, for sure. So that's great. The numbers, when you have your monthly monthly stats meetings, look how good we are. Uh, you'll be able to really brag about right. us, what, how healthy your support team is. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's... That's really what you want to do. You want to just say that it's impressive. All right. Uh, Matt, why do you want to do this? Customers uh, sometimes really make a big deal out of things when they're actually not that big of a deal. And so... Like people call 911 for the most inane reasons. Happens all the time. Yeah. You're helping them to accurately rank their tickets where they really should be. mm Mm-hmm. That's why they created 311 for all the non emergencies for 911. Yes. You be the judge of whether it's an emergency or not. Don't let them. Excellent. I'm going to give you that. Oh, yeah. Good job for that. Here, I'll give you another one. Oh, yes, sir. All right. Excellent job, everybody. I'm playing uh, Department Yes. And yes, that was Matthew Bybee. By the way, Rich, Matthew, it, yeah, but his name is spelled with one T. He's the only Matthew I know that spells it with one T. And I can't forget that. And also, by the way, I have screwed up his name because it's everyone calls it him his last name Bibby, but it's Bybee. One T. It's a one T Matthew. Do you know another one T Matthew? Either you? I don't know any of them. Well, now you I, do. I've met a couple. Makes, yeah. Have you? Ma- oh, you do? Yeah. Well, I pay attention, makes- right? Because similar name. I, I, I know a Steve who has three E's in his name. What's that? That's an excess of E's. Nobody needs that many E's in their name. It's S-T-E-E-V-E. I met him. He might be here. He's a fan of the series. All right. We have, oh, we have 10% better that, that have also come in. And what time is it? We got, oh, we're, we're in good timing right now. Let me just mention a few of the 10% betters. Mm-hmm. That could have, this one comes from Matthew Bybee. Have a product roadmap that you show to your customers and have a process for your customers to request features. Um, that is actually pretty good. Is there an opportunity to do that within uh, Vanta? Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like that that's like table stakes for, for SAS. Uh, yeah. Showing that kind of thing. And Janet, uh, do you, does your, let me ask you, do your vendors have product roadmaps that they show you? Do you show product roadmaps and how well do they keep to those product roadmaps? So some vendors show product roadmaps. Um, and I, Always appreciate that because mm-hmm. that way you're not maybe surprised. Um, I think I'd like to think that they try to keep to those roadmaps, but you know, not in all cases, right? So, yeah. um, or they're just not ready to commit to even when here's a, here's a thing that's going to be available, but we can't tell it. We don't know when yet, right? Ooh. So that's that's kind of annoying because it really whatever that thing is is usually something like either we've asked for it ourselves um, or it's something that we were like oh that would that'd be really great to have and then it's like you know dangle dangle <laughs> not not ideal speaking of that david has a great bad idea he just threw in have a different roadmap for each client so the client always hears what they want to hear it. that is a great suggestion david <laughs> by the way i wouldn't be surprised if many have done that <laughs> Because certain people do want to hear certain stuff. I love it. Um, before we, you know, we're about 15 minutes from uh, from wrapping up. Let me ask, what, Matt, what don't people ask about trust that they should be asking? 
Hmm. What don't they ask? Um, either either yeah. looking for it or building it. Which okay. Been. Okay. So, um, I I think one challenge in in trust is um, it's almost the opposite of that. Actually, uh, it's asking irrelevant or just generic questions because they're basing it on some kind of like industry standard questionnaire or they're asking something that you know they were told to ask but they don't actually understand the applicability of that uh, so i hear that from you know customers a lot too is you you get these questionnaires or you get a customer kind of drilling into something and it's actually not particularly relevant for the actual risk of that vendor so i think you know when you're buying it it is ideal if you have the capability to really like truly assess what is this vendor doing for me and what are the relevant risks and not just throw them like a laundry list of generic questions make them jump through a bunch of hoops when like you don't even care about this information or again it's not relevant what about you jane i'll ask the same question to you what don't people ask about trust I think uh, the reputation, right? I think it's it's a hard question to to ask when you haven't really built that relationship yet. Um, you know, how are they doing with their other customers? So I'm on the you know the buying side, not the selling side, right? So how are they doing with their other customers? How are they how are they able to rank, you know, their long term relationships? Uh, again, it'd be, it would be from their perspective, but I think it's something that um, helps demonstrate you know, A, that they even pay attention to that, right? B, that they value it, right? And that, those those are important. I, I got to assume that you hear about vendors through co industry colleagues. Yes, Janet? Um, yeah. 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 Do do you put any weight on testimonials that say the vendor would publish themselves? Uh, and by the way, not, I know in this industry, it's very tough to get testimonials too, yeah, but go ahead. Uh, not, not much. I mean... Not, not, and that's not, you know, a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, they incentivize their, incentivize their customers sometimes to be able to do, to get good uh, marketing material, if you will. So right. I think it's, it's really about the, the people that you already trust telling you, oh, I work with company yeah. X and I'm, yeah, yeah, exactly. It kind of exactly. has to work that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, I mean, heck, I mean, assuming that's how you get business. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I was going to say something similar, but I would say, you know, if the testimonial is from someone that we either know or, you know, has a good reputation, then of course, uh, I think we would put more stock in it, uh, but it's yeah. a similar, it's a similar thing. Um, who, who's giving the testimonial? Uh, do they have credibility? Do they have integrity? Things like that. Or do we know who they are? Um, I am going to, here, I'm reopening this question that I had before that was, here, whoops, go back to this. Um, and here, this was the one from Joshua Mason that when you finally came back, we, we, we bailed on this and came back. Do people go to sites like Security Scorecard before talking to a vendor? What is your experience you've seen, um, uh, Matt? Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say no, uh, cause, because I think the flow is a bit different. Because when you are going to buy a product or use a vendor, there's some business case for that, right? And, and oftentimes that business case isn't driven by a security team. And so the, the buyer who's going to use the product or service, they're focused on, will this product or service do the thing for me? You know, give me delight or, you know, solve my pain. And that security review then comes in later. So I think it's more like at the 11th hour, when uh, you know you're you're going down this road to to buy it, and now it's an under security review, and now someone throws out, oh look at their you know their security scorecard ranking, it's terrible. I don't know if we can actually move forward with that vendor. So I think it's going to be more at the end than at the beginning. Um, that's my that's my hot take. I don't know if Janet sees it differently. Yeah, I mean, ideally it wouldn't be at the end, uh, and you know I constantly work to make it be more upfront. And I think, you know, to, to say, here's, here's my bad idea. My bad idea is as a, as a, as a vendor meet with a customer without any technology people in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a bad idea and we, it happens all the time. And I think and quite frankly, it's a little irresponsible because you can, 
you know, you're, you're selling to the people who want the thing, right? The thing, as Matt says, it makes them happy or makes their day better, right? Uh, so they're going to be all in and they're not thinking about the, is it a technology fit? Does it fit within our environment? Is it secure? Uh, can we maintain it if it's, you know, something that we have to have, you know, maintain ourselves, that kind of thing. So I think that's really important. If I had, you know, any message out there to the vendors, it would be don't have a meeting with a customer unless they bring technology members. Can I tell you, I used to have this issue where we, where I would have meetings with vendors and they didn't bring tech people and they do this line of, oh, you know, that's above my pay grade or I'll have one of the, the propeller heads, you know, always a demeaning line like that, uh, you know, answer your question and, and follow up. And no one ever follows up, like ever. It, it's irritating beyond belief. All right. Um, the... Um, uh let me say tra trade shows is another place I see that where, you know, if you're trying to go and, and, and walk the floor and see every, everyone's product, but they only have, you know, a, like a, a salesperson who really doesn't know anything about it. Um, it's not that helpful. Whereas, you know, someone else there, they have product manager engineers, you know, on the floor trying to actually answer your questions because they're really trying to move something forward. I, 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 I value that. I will tell you there's a similar flip side to that very problem. So when I walk around a trade show floor, I often have a press badge. This problem only hasn't happened in a while, but it used to happen all the time. And that is I'll be talking to someone in the booth, just some average person booth and asking questions about their product, whatnot. And their PR person will say, no, no, you do not want to talk to that person. You want to talk to this person. I go, wait a second, I'm having a good conversation with this person. And I tell the PR person, skedaddle, like we're doing fine here. Go away. But like that person wasn't media trained, so they shouldn't be talking to you. And it, it's just insulting. Like, no, I'm breaking up this conversation. <laughs> Don't ever do. If they're in your booth, make sure they're media trained is my attitude. <laughs> make sure they're media trained. Um, all right. Uh, everyone, click the link at the bottom of the screen, please. Would you do that right now? Because in about two minutes or one minute, I'm going to uh, change it. I want to. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get our final thoughts on on everything that we've uh, been discussing today. And then we're going to go to our, um, uh, our, our meetup portion. So, cause we are eight minutes from uh, ending this here. Where is my little, why is it not showing up? Come on, pop up. My, my presentation is not showing here. Let me hide again. Now show, show, there we go. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong button. My fault. Now we're doing this. User error, everybody. Here we go. Hey, huge thanks to Vanta for sponsoring this episode. Thank you, Matt. We were sponsoring a bunch of these, three of these. It was great. This is your second one, and we did one with your colleague as well. So thank you very much for sponsoring this the uh, Super Cyber Friday event. We've had a lot of fun with you. Um, hey, uh, starting in about 90 minutes, um, uh, by the way, we and by the way, remember, we'll have the Super Cyber Friday next week. And you can always, by the way, go to our events page and register for uh, future Super Cyber Friday events and any other event that we have coming up. But we are going to, 90 minutes from now, or actually 97 minutes from now, we're going to be doing our Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review with Christina Shannon, who's a CIO at Kick Consumer Products. Actually, she used to also be a CISO. So she's got the pay grade to pull this off. She's awesome on the show as well. Um, stick around for our meetup. Now, Aaron, our amazing producer, would you change the link at the bottom? Look at that. Like that, he changed it. Phenomenal job. Uh, stick around for our meetup. Um, just click the link at the bottom. You can actually do that now and register and get in. It's a ton of fun. If you've never been there, please join us. It's a lot of fun. Uh, lastly, I just want to say, if you want to sponsor Super Cyber Friday, we're sold out for 2023, but we have plenty of availability in 2024. Please join us. Just email me at david at cisoseries.com and we'll get you all set up. All right, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I want to ask you, Matt, um, well, actually, let me start with you, Jen. I'm sorry. In all your years of building trust, in all your years working in cybersecurity, what have been your greatest learnings of, I'm glad I learned to not do that anymore, and now I'm doing this? What would you sort of educate us all on? That's a tough one to just like come out with. Don't have it well, ready. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, on the topic of trust and, and third parties, I think the, the thing that I've um, moved away from is and, and have changed for the better, I think, is 
um, uh, having, um, you know, kind of keeping your vendors kind of at a, as a, as, at a distance, right? Your partner, your partners at a distance and not, you know, um, letting them in to know what your roadmap is and what you're trying to get to get at uh, and what your priorities are. Because if you do, and you, you may, and I do that more now, I do a lot, do a lot of that now, um, not from cold calls, um, but, you know, once I have some, you know, an established relationship with a vendor to keep the relationship building. And so, um, you know, I'm not, if I, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out in the audience that would say, if I spent all my time sharing my roadmap with potential vendors, I wouldn't be doing my day job ever. Cause that's pretty much what some vendors ask for when they don't know you and they want to meet with you. And just, can you spend 20 minutes telling me about your, your roadmap? And I'm like, I don't know who you are. No, thank you. So I still keep them a little bit of a, at a distance, but certainly the ones that I may want to do business with, or I think have something good going on, or my network has told me is a good vendor, but we're not using them yet. I will definitely, I do now share more about what, you know, when I, where I can, some things are confidential, but where I can, what we're working on and what our priorities are from a security perspective. And and that helps your relationship, I would assume. It helps, yeah. it helps the relationship and it also helps them frame those, you know, we're joking about how, you know, the roadmaps are, the vendors present roadmaps, different roadmaps for different companies, but it does kind of help them f at least focus on the thing. Cause if you ever, you know, you sit through these vendor meetings and like, we do everything and here I'm going to tell you about everything we do. And it's like, but I don't need help there because I already have this thing over here. Uh, or I just signed this deal with this other vendor last month. So I'm not looking to change yet. You know, so it's, if they know that they can tailor it. So it's more valuable to you. You know, Josh yeah. Mason posted this as a, as a bad idea, but I think he was joking because it really is a good idea. Have a product roadmap and actually follow it rather than using it as a sales tool. So, yes, it's what we should all do. Uh, so, Matt, closing, um, what have you learned in your yeah. years in the cyber world that you're like, I'm glad I'm not doing this anymore and I made those mistakes and let's not make those anymore? Yeah, I, I, it's actually kind of similar, but... Uh, being afraid to be transparent and be honest um, and always trying to, you know, like look perfect. Uh, I think that being more genuine can help you. Now, that being said, your organization, I think, needs like a baseline of maturity in order to feel comfortable with that, where you actually do feel pretty good about your security posture. But, you know, everyone, literally everyone has things that they can improve on and do better. And actually, that to me is actually a sign of maturity in an organization is knowing exactly what your problems are and what your weaknesses are, you know, because it shows that you have identified those and you're working towards them. Um, and so in the right context, you know, with the right guardrails and safeguards, you know, being able to be a genuine with customers, I think, you know, goes a long way and, and not being afraid to do that. All right. With our just a very little bit of time left right now, less than two minutes, I just want to uh, I want to say thank you again for Vanta sponsoring. If people are interested in, in checking out this pretty awesome tool that Vanta has, um, what's the best way? What's the best way to engage with you? And and yes, Jane and Matt, you're going to be both available for our meetup right afterwards. Yes, awesome. Yes. Gotcha. Uh, yes, Matt. What, what's the best way to engage with you? Oh, uh, you. Uh, we we posted it. Maybe Rich could do it again. But uh, Vanta slash Friday is one thing way to get a hold of uh, Vanta. And for me personally, you know, find me on LinkedIn. Um, okay. Happy to talk. Yeah. My apologies. I did not mention the poll. If you would like a actual warm handoff to Vanta, please, like right now, go Boom. to the polls and click that right now because we're wrapping up right this very second. But you can always just contact us directly or contact Vanta as well. We're happy to happy to make a, a nice warm handoff to Vanta. So thank you very much. Janet, thank you so much for coming for today's Super Cyber Friday. Great Hope you had here. a good time, even with the technical difficulties, which I'm pretty sure you purposely caused. Yeah, I need a little uh, more time on that one. Crowdcast. <laughs> <laughs> Crowdcast. Yeah, we'll just blame Crowdcast, which, by the way, we have blamed Crowdcast. By the way, Crowdcast is a perfect example. They have worked with us a lot. They're a totally cool group of people, but they've had a lot of problems over the years. And uh, we've stuck with this technology because it actually serves us well. But, yeah, they've had some issues. <laughs> they definitely have had some issues. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, – oh, yeah, right. Mary just put it, com slash Friday for a discount offer. Uh Thank you very, very much for that. Anyways, everyone, at this moment, we're wrapping up right now. Please click the link at the bottom of the screen. Join us in the in the after party chat. We'd love to chat with you. Let's have some fun. We can talk about whatever the heck you want to. And 
Janet may be hiring. She can't say anything right now, but she may be. I'm not putting any words in her mouth, but she may at one time be hiring. So it might be nice to just have a chat with her now. All right. Thank you very much, Aaron. Take us out. <laughs>